You obviously grew up around music and musicians, but can you remember when you started to get seriously interested in pursuing your own music as a career option? And what was maybe influencing that and you in those times? I often get asked, when did I decide to make music my life? I think I really had no choice. From as young as I can remember, I was starting my love affair with music. I remember being an eight-year-old in 1968 and listening to Cilla Black, Anyone Who Had a Heart, and being blown away. Um, that affair just continued, and when I became a teenager, I dreamt of uh, being Agnetha and Abba or Lindsay DePaul or Olivia Newton-John. And uh, But I was also listening to some great albums from the Beatles and Joni Mitchell and Aretha Franklin and Crosby, Stills and Nash and it was all very diverse because I had this amazing record collection at home um, that belonged to my parents. Um, so it was kind of confusing because I love pop music but I really loved the whole um, singer-songwriter uh, thing. Uh, Stevie Wonder and Paul Simon and uh, Paul McCartney and John Lennon and so it goes on and on. Um, really confusing for a young girl to get her head around where do I fit in in all of that in all of that amazing uh, inspiring brilliant music where does Kim Smith belong in all of that and it, do you know what it took me years to really uh, discover who uh, I was as a musician myself and it didn't really happen properly probably until later in my career truly. But you know what? I had so much fun making great pop records with my father and my brother in the 80s. And uh, it set me on a, an amazing adventure, um, an adventure of self-discovery as an artist, as a writer myself. And, but you know what? What I love to do most? I love to sing. What are your memories of Mickey Most and signing the deal with Rack Records that began your recording career? Back in 1980, um, I was living at home with my brother Ricky Wilde, with our mum and dad. Um, Ricky had already left school and was uh, in a band with my dad playing keyboards and guitar for him. And my dad had some down studio time, studio time he wasn't going to be using, um, offered it up to Rick. Rick went in and came back with these great songs. And at the time, i just left art college and I wanted to get into the session scene. Um, I knew how to do harmonies very well, spent our years growing up singing along to the Everly Brothers and the Carpenters. Um, so I knew how to pitch a harmony and, um, and I thought, well, if I can make some money being a session singer, I'd be more than happy. Um, Ricky at, the, at that time um, went to London to uh, find his fortune and um, made an appointment with Mickey Most and the rest is history. Um, Kids in America got written very quickly after that first meeting. Um, my involvement with working with Ricky as producer happened uh, organically, spontaneously, naturally, and remains to this day. Hallelujah. The songs on the first album were mainly written by your father, Marty, and your brother, Ricky, with Ricky also taking on production duties. How much were you involved in the creation of those songs at the recording stage, and what are your memories of being in the studio making that first album? My first album, Kim Wilde, after we recorded Kids in America, which incidentally we had recorded in the Enid studio in Hertfordshire. Um, but we went on to record most of the rest of the album at Rack Records in Charlbert Street, um, our sort of natural pop home, uh, with Mickey Most at the helm walking into the studio and um, giving his great advice and inspiration to tracks we were doing. But he respected us to, uh, enough to let us get on with things. Um, he particularly had a very strong connection with Ricky and, and that proved to be an amazing thing for all of us. Um, being at Rack Studios was almost like being, well it was like being at a second home and when I go back there now, that's how I feel. You know it hasn't changed in all these years and it still attracts uh, the creme de la creme um, and we've been there recently recording ourselves. So recording at that time at Rack, um, I was very involved in the songwriting process, the production process, that, um, in all of it. Um, but ultimately, Ricky was at the helm doing the production. Marty and Rick were coming up with these great pop tunes and I was having the time of my life. Kids in America was your breakthrough hit around the world and still seen by many as your signature song. What are your memories of recording it and how has your relationship with it changed during the years? 
I remember the first time Ricky played me Kids in America. He'd been uh, putting the backing track down at the lodge, the studio that the Enid um, band owned in Hertfordshire. Uh, I went down there and heard this track and I couldn't believe it. It was electrifying. Pretty soon after, my father had come up with these really crazy lyrics about kids in America. Um, that were, they were sort of based on some, some ideas he had and stories he had in his mind. But, you know, when I heard it, I re really connected to it from a very personal point of view. You know, I love the attitude of the song. Um, I love that the girl in it was just shrugging that boy off when he put his hand on her shoulder. And she was, uh, you know, she was a tough little cookie not to be messed with and um and that was me um and i love that song i loved it then and then of course the years went by and everyone's still talking about kids in america and i think i got to um about 10 or maybe later 15 years later and my love affair with kids in america had started to wane you know too much of a good thing uh at that time i decided any way to get out the music industry I just met my husband, Hal. Uh, we wanted to have a family, and it was easy to walk away from that song. It was a relief to walk away from that song because it was such a huge, overwhelming song to have in your life. Um, you couldn't, you know, it just didn't fit anymore. Um, and then I started to miss it, of course, and when I got lured back to do some 80s concerts and I saw the reaction from the audience, you know what brought me back to Kids in America? the audience, the people who came to those concerts, they took me back again. They helped me, helped to reconnect me to that very beautiful song, as it turned out. So now when I get to sing that song now, it's just incredible. The audience have reconnected me with Kids in America. Uh, the joy that people have when they hear it, that energy, you can feel it coming towards you slowly, but like solid, like a big body, like a tsunami of emotion. And you'd be, you wouldn't be alive if you didn't feel the energy that that song creates every time we still play it. So thank you out there for bringing Kids in America back into my heart. You enjoyed incredible success very early into your career with both hit singles and albums around the world. How did you cope with that first flush of fame? Was it exciting, terrifying, or both? The early days of my career were amazing. I was 21, I just had a massive hit with Kids in America, and all of a sudden I was on a plane going to everywhere in the world, all over the world, Paris, Hamburg, Munich. I was in Sydney, I was in Italy, I was in Spain, I was in America. Um, yeah, I lived in the air, I was in Sweden, I was in Denmark, I was in Norway. I was all over the world, traveling and doing TVs, doing press, doing photo shoots, and it was fantastic. You know, I, I was living the dream, literally, um, and I loved every minute of it. I was very well supported. I had great, solid family behind me. So I had two people in the studio writing great pop tunes while I was out working and promoting those songs. It was all a part of it. And um, yeah, we were an unstoppable machine, um, as it turned out. Um, you know, we just kept having hit after hit and that continued for quite some time. And, um, and I loved every minute of it. I was very supported, as I said before. Um, I had a lot of people around making sure I was safe, keeping a close eye on me. <laughs> and a jolly good thing too. Your first tour was in 1982. Can you explain what it was like playing live and how important it is being a live performer in your career to date? So for the first year or so of my career, I didn't play live at all. Kiss in America happened so quickly, uh, there wasn't really time to sort of suddenly think, well, actually, I should be sort of going around the pubs and singing songs, shouldn't I? Um, although I would have loved to have done that. So my career sort of started the other way around. And um, I had to sort of find myself um, as a live artist throughout the years. And it's actually only been in the last 10 years that I felt truly comfortable with being a live performer. But uh, back in 1982, I did my first tour, did a few ha a handful of dates in Denmark. And then I did, um, I think, about a 19 or 20 date tour in the UK. Um, that's when I first started working with musicians, with my co-writer Steve Bird, um, Mark Hayward Chaplin, a number of other amazing musicians and I started to really fall in love with being a live performer. Um, 
Yeah, so my first tour um, taught me a lot about uh, how to work with audiences, but as I say, it took me many years to do that. And I'd watched my father as a live performer all my life, as a child standing, standing side of stage, uh, watching how he made that connection with an audience, you know, and it took me a long time to find that confidence. And, uh, but I did eventually, and now I'm sort of feeling that the live part of my career is the most rewarding and the one that I feel that I can match up to uh, as a performer, as a singer, as someone who puts out records. So now, yeah, after all these years, actually performing for me is the most joyful thing. Going out on a Greatest Hits tour really fills me with so much excitement. Um, I don't think I had the confidence really to do uh, the kind of tour I'm going to be doing back in the day at all um, and it took me quite a few years to find that confidence um, really don't know why it took quite so long but um, I seem to do a good job in the meantime and I'm very glad I got to hear where I am right now after three albums on rack you decided to leave and sign with MCA what were the reasons behind making that move I suppose I felt I'd had matured somewhat and was given another opportunity to work with MCA records um, now, on reflection, hmm, I wish I'd stayed at Rat Records. Can I tell you that? It's just a secret between you and I. Um, sometimes moving on isn't the best idea at all. MCA were great, don't get me wrong, and we had great success together, and, um, and I don't regret it at all. But um, there was something very special about Rat Records and working with Mickey Mose, and if you ever find a relationship like that, no matter how tough it can get, and, and no matter how much you might not like what they say sometimes, sometimes you really just got to work through it. I wish we had. As you moved into Teases and Dares, your first album for MCA, you started writing more songs yourself. Was it challenging to begin this process? And how would you say your journey as a songwriter has progressed along with your career as a performer? In 1984, um, I had just moved down to London. I'd been living with my parents and my mum and dad had had two little babies in that time. Uh, my sister Roxanne and my brother Marty. Um, yeah, and I left home. I, I was able to buy myself a small place in London. And um, I, the key reason was really because I wanted to start writing my own songs. Um, I needed some space to do that and I found it and started writing. And then a couple of my songs ended up on teasers and dares. But I have to say the whole process of songwriting was torturous. I think when you first song, write a song, it's, it's so hard, you know, you, you are constantly... Um, uh, really critical of yourself. I mean, even very advanced writers um, are, are very critical of themselves. So you can imagine how hard it is when you start. But um, Ricky and Marty were really uh, encouraging and, and I was determined I would find my voice as a songwriter somehow. So I, ten I made some tentative steps on the album, Teases and Dares, and I haven't stopped since. You enjoyed incredible success with your cover of You Keep Me Hanging On, including a US number one. How did the idea to record that song come together and how exciting was it to have that success in America? In 1986, um, I was continuing to be really involved as a songwriter uh, on my Another Step album, uh, particularly with my co-writer at that time, Steve Bird, my guitarist. Um, meanwhile, Ricky was in our recording studio that we'd had built um, within the last few years of that, um, coming up with some great songs, including a great cover version of You Keep Me Hanging On. And I remember walking in and hearing this amazing backing track and thinking, oh, wow, I haven't heard that song for a long time. I'm not going to go and listen to it. I want to bring something really fresh to it. I don't want to have any references to the original or any other versions. Let's just see what we can come up with. I haven't changed the words, I think. Not that that bothered Lamont Dozier, who sent me a telemessage um, shortly after it went to number one in America, uh, thanking me for making such an exciting uh, production and work on, on uh, You Keep Me Hanging On. I think it would... Number one in America for the third time. What a great song. Um, so, yeah, um, You Keep Me Hanging On was a, a, a real game-changer for Ricky and I, and it was a precursor to um, the album Close in 1988, and that's when everything just went... Bang. Back in the UK, you had an amazing run of success in the late 80s, three top 10 singles in 1988, and a top 10 album. Was the experience of this period very different to the initial success you had? And if so, how? Even at that time in 1988, where things were going so well, my career had had its ups and downs, and I had 
the taste of what it felt like to not have a successful album and not have a hit record, not have the radio want to play your record. So I'd really been through the roller coaster of, of a pop career by the late 80s. And so by the time um, You Came came out and Four Letter Word and Never Trust a Stranger and Hey Mr Heartache, I'm, I was so grateful that everyone was still really interested in what I was doing again. Um, and I still loved what I was doing you know, more than anything. And... Um, so yeah, it was a it was a wonderful time to uh, in my career. I, the Michael Jackson Bad Tour obviously came at a great time to promote Close, and um, they were uh, amazing days. I will look back on them really fondly. Um, but you know what? Some of the best days happened in the years after. In the nineties, you took a break from releasing music for a lengthy period of time and developed other careers. What was behind your decision to move back from music? And what was it that made you want to return to making records again in the mid-2000s? In the 90s and just beyond, I had started to have sort of feelings that I needed to find another path. Um, I'd been uh, in the music industry for over a decade, much more than over a decade, and I felt like I needed a break. To be honest with you, I think I was a bit bored <laughs> and um, just needed to mix things up a bit. Uh, I felt that walking away was probably the best thing to do. You know, uh, you don't want to be the last person at the party. No, no, no. So luckily it coincided with being asked to play Mrs. Walker in the musical Tommy in the West End, where I met my husband Hal. And very quickly we decided to get married. And that, was, that just sort of sealed the deal, really. I thought, you know what, I'm going to walk away. I'm going to get married or we're going to have some kids and I'm going to see what happens. And then horticulture came into my life massively. I ended up going back to, uh, into education and studying horticulture. The whole thing was phenomenal, still is, still is a massive part of my life. And the thing that got me back again was the children growing up a little bit and not being quite so needy of me. Um, although they always are. <laughs> and... Um, yeah, and being asked to join an 80s, a 1980s tour, an 80s tour, yeah. Um, yeah, I was, I had second thoughts about the 80s tour. I just thought, really, you know, it was great then. And do, do, does anyone really want it, want it now? And it turned out they really did. And um, I did the tour, had a great time, had an amazing reaction and great reviews, all of us. And um, so and I haven't looked back since. Over the last 15 years, you've made five new studio albums, the last two on your own label. How has the process of writing, recording and releasing those records been versus the creation of your 80s material? Would you say the experience has made this easier, more enjoyable? I think for me, as, um, as a person and as an artist, um, getting older has just brought more and more rewards. Um, there were wonderful times at the beginning of my career with Kiss in America, amazing times in the late 80s with Close and, and You Came and amazing times but I think as I've got older I've just felt more in control of my life uh, in control of who I am and what I'm doing my output um, creating wildflower records and releasing my own albums has been uh, an amazing uh, step um, into my career that I never thought I would make um, making a Christmas album was, was hugely re rewarding a very personal album like that um, and the Here Come the Aliens. And um, yeah, I mean, for me, songwriting just becomes more and more uh, compelling um, and fun. And I'm, I'm not bored of it at all. You know, that sort of uh, that boredom that I got when I walked away from my career, uh, that's not there anymore. And maybe it's because the pressure isn't there anymore. Um, there used to be a lot of pressure about how you looked and having success and you know, pleasing the record company and stuff. And now that's all gone. And now it's just pure joy. Um, I get to do exactly what I want to do with the people I want to do it with. Um, this is as good as it gets. So I have to say from a career point of view, um, I am at the most um, happy that I've ever been. Your brother Ricky has been a part of your work, both in terms of recording and playing live throughout much of your career and is very much a part of your current work. What do you think working with someone so close to you has given your creative output over the years? So right from the start of my career, um, my brother was right at the epicenter of it, Ricky Wilde. And he had gone to Rat Records and had met, uh, caught the eye of Mickey Most. Um, and then 
I turned up at the studio to do some backing vocals. Mickey noticed me and was quite keen to get me working with um, Mike Chapman and uh, Nicky Chin. Now, Mike Chapman and Nicky Chin had written massive hits for, uh, for The Mud, um, for Susie Quattro and for the S and Sweet. I mean, just amazing anthemic pop tunes. I love, love, love. Um, you know, Mike Chapman would work on parallel lines with Blondie. So, I mean, these are great uh, producers, great pop writers. Um, and all of a sudden, Ricky turns up, and Mickey recognised uh, in, in Ricky um, that streak of genius that Mike Chapman and Nicky had had, had. And, um, and he gave over the reins to, to Ricky and to me. And Ricky has held the reins together with myself ever since. Working with Ricky is always just astonishing. I'm amazed at his um, knowledge of pop music. I mean, he's always pinging me bands I've got to listen to, records I've got to listen to. It's constant, uh, voracious appetite for great pop music. And it never leaves him. Uh, an amazing musician too. Uh, he leads our great band. Um, uh, no one really can play the a guitar quite like Ricky Wilde <laughs> and uh, and his uh, his energy on stage is, is really quite incredible I wouldn't want to be on there without him I can tell you that in a studio situation he and I we really rarely even have to say anything we have been brought up on the same kind of uh, with the same passion for pop music, listening to the same records in our mum and dad's record collection, um, loving the same kind of music, um, getting a real buzz from the same things. I mean, that's quite rare. You know, it is quite rare that um, that people have so much in common, really. And working together, you know, often people come from very different directions, but we're totally on the same page. Um, so yeah, working with Ricky, I, I think is probably one of the reasons why I'm still here loving and enjoying what I do, because, you know, working with him is such a privilege. With the release of the greatest hit set, you are celebrating a musical career spanning more than 40 years. How do you feel looking back across this time and the work that you have produced? So here we are in 2021, um, releasing, uh, an album, Pop Don't Stop certainly doesn't for me, um, my greatest hits. What an achievement, 40 years. I still got my sense of humor intact. Uh, and um, I still love pop music. What can I tell you? Uh, to be putting this out now, it's been so beautifully put together, the team of people who've put it together. I thank you, you know who you are. Um, and yeah, I'm just itching to get out there and just tell you all the stories about how it was and how it is and how it's going to be. Are there ambitions from a musical point of view that you still want to explore and achieve in the next chapter of your career? So the Greatest Hits album has already sort of started paving the way for what could happen in the future. Uh, two collaborations, one with Thomas Paul and one with Boy George. Um, more collaborations I'm really interested in. Just love working with other people. Uh, established artists and new artists, the same. It's wonderful. So a bit more of that would be great. Uh, certainly, we're going to do our Greatest Hits tour. We'll be all over the place, uh, given half the chance. And, we're going to be there with my band. Um, new costumes and everything. We're just going to really grab it with both hands, you know, because life is like that. You've got to do that while you can. And um, I'm so proud of the last 40 years and so glad and happy that I get to share it all still with my brother Ricky and that we're still able to go out and do these great live gigs and see our amazing fans and see all your faces when you're looking at us. It's just one of the best feelings in the world. We are so privileged to do what we do. And I'm so grateful. So thank you, fans out there, for keeping the flame alive. All these 40 years. Thanks for talking, Kim. See you later.